<laughs> it's true. Yeah, from nano this to nano that. Uh, my research in both chem and art. So ART is the acronym and we'll find out what that is during this talk, during this conversation. So thanks a lot for the introduction, Dr. Ben. Um, and thank you for having me on the show. This is really exciting. And uh, so, yes, I'm a postdoctoral fellow currently at University of Waterloo, located in Canada. And uh, that's where I did my PhD as well. Yeah, I didn't really move around much, but that's okay for now. Um, these are my socials if you want to connect. I do have a website, but it's still under <laughs> construction. Um, so... If you want uh, to connect with me further or you need some like direct advice or uh, any help with anything like that, please feel free to send me an email. Um, I love doing that kind of like volunteer work, connecting work. And so speaking of which, I also host my own <laughs> podcast and it's all about kind of nanotechnology and how it relates to chemistry, physics, and biology. And so that I have a co-host with Dr. Irfani Osri. These are our kind of handles that we're on Twitter and Instagram. Instagram, we have over 100 followers, which is very impressive for us, to be honest. So we're very happy with that, and we're continuously growing and trying to improve. And uh, We've been around for two years now. Uh, it'll be two years in December. And so we really like what we're doing and trying to, basically, it's, we take a journal paper and we kind of redact it and then do it in layman's terms or easy to understand terms for someone that doesn't have an advanced science background, because a lot of the titles in journal articles are, are quite intimidating if you read them. You know, it's like, oh, quantum dots and these superconductors. And, you know, we try to like redact that and make it um, more digestible to a wider audience, kind of promoting science all around. Um, so feel free to check us out and we'll have Dr. Meekins on an interview in some point in the future. So look out for that as well. And so uh, from the images you see here, I'll just say that these are a form of transistor devices that I worked on and we'll get into those as well. But at the bottom is the uh, uh, SEM image, so the scanning electron microscopy image of the transistor. And at the top is the AutoCAD redaction of it. So basically, I have little nanotubes that I marked out. I put out the pattern, and then I can make um, this pattern with metals and image it. And that's through techniques known as electron beam lithography. And so with that, and this is me kind of testing the device in what's called a clean room on a source measurement unit, an SMU. This is very, very exciting stuff. So hopefully over the next 25-ish to 30 minutes, I know there's no really a time limit, but uh, <laughs> that's what I'll be kind of covering. And so what I'm currently doing right now real briefly is I kind of pivoted from my PhD research that I'm going to talk about with the transistors and all that uh, into I did a, a couple of months with a startup, more than a couple of months, it was almost a full year, a startup company using you know, where we developed antimicrobial materials. And uh, so that was with the Center for Advanced Materials Joining in Engineering. So I stayed at the same university that I did my PhD, but I changed departments. So I went into the engineering department because they needed a chemist. So I worked on this type of antimicrobial coating and the coating was meant for face masks. So kind of very relevant where we got a provisional patent on that. Uh, unfortunately, the company had a fallout. So then I pivoted my research into doing water electrochemistry and purification and flexible electronics. So it's kind of all over the place, but got experience in different things. In terms of the water purification research, um, I just released two papers this year um, uh, regarding the topic and the research I did. And those are freely open access and available. So from my Google Scholar, those can be accessible. And they're very interesting, um, but we'll get into my more bread and butter, if you will, which is organic material synthesis. So I, that's a very actually exciting field. And that's what I did my PhD work on. Um, and in organic, it's not about vegetables in this case. Organic chemistry is about making molecules that have carbon as a main component in them. And the organic materials part means that I'm making these little molecules specifically for these devices or different types of material applications rather than 
making them for the pharmaceutical industry or drug molecules, which is the more common form of where you see organic molecules and the synthesis part being adapted to. Um, so I almost defended about two years ago now, which is crazy to think. Uh, a little bit of a complicated title. That's why um, we abbreviate it to ART, Alignment Relay Technique, which I'm going to cover, and then nanosystems. I focus mainly on carbon nanotubes, but other tech systems I did try, like nanowires, nano ribbons, uh, other types of very, very small <laughs> chemical components. And so overall, uh, is is very interesting. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, so we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll get into it. Let's just get into it. Yeah. So our, uh, I'll preface this with our current technology. It relies upon silicon metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. I know that's a mouthful, but that abbreviates to silicon MOSFETs. And so these SI MOSFETs follow the trend of doubling in number on a chip every two years. Now chip is what we're currently having a shortage of, which is why cars are so expensive, electronics are getting more and more expensive um, because they all need these chips to have that advanced technology that we're so reliant on. Like we wouldn't be able to have this Zoom meeting or this Twitch stream without the transistor technology in our computers or our cell phones or our other devices, right? However, there's a plateau in terms of the number of transistors that we can integrate in a device. And that leads to no progress in power or performance as we can see from the plot here. So we have to look towards other methods for either replacement or enhancement of the silicon FETs. Now, one alternative is to use single walled carbon nanotubes, SWCNTs, SWNTs, some people like to call them. I like to call them SWINs throughout my degree, but that didn't really catch on. But I'll kind of call them throughout the talk SWNTs, SWCNTs, or SWINs, um, because I think it's catchy. <laughs> no one else really thought so during my PhD. Maybe now that, that I have my doctorate, people <laughs> will be like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Um, let's call it this. But regardless, we can obtain the same transport properties as silicon, but with greater room for scalability. Now, thanks to the atomic thickness of these carbon nanotubes, they require also less power to operate. That means low operating voltage, but they have high transport. They can transport a large amount of current. Therefore, the properties of these tiny tubes made up of silicon's upstairs neighbor, carbon, make them a worthy alternative in the FET market. Now, the question is, if they're so great, well, what's holding us back, Monica? Come on, what's going on? Well, essentially, these carbon nanotubes, they can have, there's different types of them. So they can behave differently depending on how they're essentially created. Their chirality can be different. So basically we can have metallic carbon nanotubes or we can have semiconducting ones. And for FETs, these transistors, which are switches, it's really undesirable to have a switch that you can't turn off. So selection for these semiconducting CNTs over metallic types is key. You also need many on the surface. You can't just have one or two and expect to, to um, replace silicon. That's, it's not going to work that way. You need many of them onto the surface. But you also need to control how they position themselves for efficient transport between the source and the drain. So the problem of carbon nanotube FETs is therefore threefold. We want a specific type. We want to control the position, their orientation, and we want a lot of them. So hence our goal, or as part of the skipper group where I worked at and did my doctoral work, the goal was to solve these issue, is, issues, ideally, all at the same time. Like that would be perfect. That would be great if we could do that. And so that leads me into what has been established so far before I get into my work. So what am I basing my technology on? So essentially, uh, one of the first inspirations for the alignment really tech art 
is that, well, we can functionalize a surface which with either these aromatic silanes or these amines, these NH2 groups. And it's been shown that through this functionalization, we can have a preference for either metallic or semiconducting tubes. However, the alignment wasn't uniform throughout the surface in this work because the solution of the tubes was drop casted on a wafer and then spin coated. So it went really, really fast at a high RPM and it wasn't even throughout the surface. But there was some selectivity there. So another method of alignment or to possibly align CNTs is during the growth process. So how we create the carbon nanotubes. If we grow them on certain surfaces during the CVD, chemical vapor deposition process, a surface such as sapphire that have steps in place for the CNTs to grow, it's possible to have them all aligned. However, in this way, you still get metallic tubes on the surface, so you're not selecting for the different types. There's also dielectrophoresis, and that presents an avenue for separation of the different metallicities. So you can have separate the conducting and the semiconducting. You can also have patterning, but it's very difficult to scale in this method. There's also a technique called FESA, which is floating evaporative self-assembly. And that showcases semiconducting carbon nanotubes in an ink deposited on a water interface with vertical pulling. This results in bands of aligned semiconducting swims, but it's not all throughout the surface. It's in bands throughout the substrate. And another very recent method, so this was actually in a science paper in 2020, Dimension-limited self-assembly, and this has shown high alignment using polymer-wrapped carbon nanotubes. They're pre-purified semiconducting tubes, I should mention, but they align very well to a surface with very high degree of accuracy because they're self-assembling using a butene interface in the work. So currently, these are the best solution processing methods we have for carbon nanotube alignment. And as we can see here, this recent paper does fairly well in terms of degree of alignment and carbon nanotube density, which we also talked about. We need many, many tubes on the surface. We can't just have one or two aligned. Now, the question is, how does the art or the skipper group or my work in general intend to contribute to this field? And this was just the alignment problem. What about the sorting problem? And so introduced here and in this topic is a competitive small molecule approach that can target the carbon nanotube alignment and the sorting problem. So that's the alignment relay technique, ART. <laughs> now, this method is based on ictosine small molecules, which have been shown to have pi-pi stacking interactions with carbon nanotubes. And that is because of their favorable double bond sp2 backbone. And that's found in both systems. And the pi bonds themselves, so those double bonds that create these benzene ring systems, they favorably stack to one another. And that's common throughout the literature. Now, in addition to this, this particular molecule that we've designed here, this iptocene structure, it has a concave nature to it. So it can match up with the cylindrical nature of the CNTs, which are tubes, which are you know, nice and round curvature to them. So kind of like a tweezer, it can pick them out of solution. So we have this added component here, I should add in the red. So the core for the carbon nanotube binding is in the blue and in the red here is this anchoring group. So we can anchor this component here. This can covalently bond onto a wide range of surfaces um, that have been oxidized. So the ethyl groups displace the hydroxyl groups. And then we have a very, very strong bond onto different surfaces. So the molecule kind of won't budge. So it can't easily be removed and it can't easily be washed away. So this is really nice that we have this kind of tweezer based on pi-pi stacking, positive pi-pi interactions, and the concave structure, the concave nature of it, which is kind of part where the organic synthesis part comes in, designing this molecule for this particular purpose of creating a carbon nanotube tweezer. Now, the question is, that falls into 
where does art come into play? Because how do we control the position of these tweezers? So that's where the technique was developed. And that's where really um, my work focused on for about four years. So the art method has the iptocene molecule, but it's dissolved into what is known as a liquid crystal. And so liquid crystals have a high degree of alignment associated with them. And we use 5CB in this case, but there's other forms and other structures. And liquid crystals, they align fairly readily depending on their environment and what type they are. In this case, what we're doing is because of the nature of the liquid crystal, the alignment is being transferred onto the molecule. And therefore the position of the molecule is being controlled onto the surface. So instead of having a self-assembled monolayer or SAM, we're having a controlled assembled monolayer thanks to this type of methodology and kind of manipulating the nature of the liquid crystal. And so liquid crystals, that's what's found in your LCDs, your liquid crystal displays. So this process of aligning them using an aligning layer as shown here, this is a fairly common and widely adapted, very mature technique. So what we do here is we align the liquid crystal, the 5CB, and we place it onto this alignment layer. And that's mixed in with this iptocene molecule. So the alignment layer aligns the ridged rod-like molecules here, the liquid crystal, and that liquid crystal imparts its alignment towards the blue molecules as shown here. So and then what happens is that we place an oxidized wafer onto the surface. So SiO2, the silica, we press the two together. And so what happens is that, I'm, as I mentioned on the previous slide, we have that bonding, a covalent bonding, that displacement, the reaction that happens between the oxidized surface, that oxidized substrate of the silica, and the phosphonate groups onto, on, of our iptocene molecule. So the two combine here. This reaction takes about a day or two to complete. And then from there, the molecule, that iptocene, the blue one here, is transferred, all aligned onto the surface of our target substrate, the silica. And then what we can do is what's really nice actually, is we can wash away all the excess of molecules that's not bonded along with the liquid crystal. So the liquid crystal itself is just a solvent. It doesn't bind to the surface at all. And that can be, then we can collect that, we can concentrate that and then reuse the solution later again. Uh, so that has a nice sustainability aspect to the chemistry. Once we have our functionalized surface or functionalized substrate here with all our aligned molecules, what we then is take the functionalized wafer and place it onto a solution, into a solution of carbon nanotubes. So the carbon nanotubes are as a homogeneous mixture. We place the wafer in the surface and we allow the carbon nanotubes to deposit onto the surface. Now, so I will stop there because I know it's kind of a multi-step approach. Are there any questions for me with regards to the art technique and the method, Ben? Dr. Ben, sorry. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's, that's good. That's pretty good for like almost 11 p.m. at night. So that's, that's great. <laughs> good to know. Thank you. All right. So basically, to this extent, the art presents a unique molecular tweezer approach to aligning these carbon nanotubes, wherein we could also select for the different types of the tubes. Um, and that the different types of selectivity, the semiconducting versus metallic that I mentioned before, that comes actually from the diameter of the CNTs. And that diameter of selectivity comes from because of the structure of our iptocene molecule here. So the shape of the tweezer can help dictate our, our selectivity of the nanotubes. And the combination with the liquid crystal and the art technique align the CNTs on the surface, as we can see from the atomic force microscopy, the AFM images here. Without the technique implemented, if we just even have the molecules on the surface, but no liquid crystal in, in the mix, none of the alignment happens. But when we implement the full art technique, 
then we get alignment of this TNTs. There are things still to improve, such as the density and the reproducibility of the system and different things to investigate. So my overall research question actually during my PhD was what can be done to improve or explore art further? Because it was such a preliminary technique, I think my predecessor actually just developed the method like a few months, like two months literally before I joined the lab. So what can I do to make it more efficient? So my work was separated into four different studies as there were four areas I wanted to explore. So for one, how can the method be changed to improve alignment? Two, what other surfaces does this technique work with? Three, uh, are other nanosystems possible with art or is it strictly nanotubes? Single wall carbon nanotubes, are those the only ones that work? So are there other nanostructures? And finally, with the end goal for FETs, can we actually build working carbon nanotube field effect transistors? Or do the iptocenes interfere? Are our devices on par with others or are they significantly worse or are they even better? So those are the kind of questions I set up to answer. So projects one, two, three, I'm not gonna go over all of them, um, but they are three published papers and the entire thesis of it of the entirety of my thesis was actually selected for publication with Springer Thesis Outstanding Awards um, for PhD research. So that is also readily available. That I think has a paywall on it, but I think the other ones are open access at this point or have become available through the internet. If not, if you can't find them, please let me know. Uh, I can send them your way if you're interested in learning more about the work or if you're interested in collaborating as well. Collaboration is always good. <laughs> Love to collaborate and talk with others. Um, but that was kind of the projects one, two, three. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on project four, which really I discovered throughout my research that I really like molecular electronics. Like that was awesome to kind of do this work and fabricate these field effect transistors and test them and see how this works. So I did fabricate and make FETs using the method, using ART. I did two configurations, one as a bottom gate and one as a top gated structure, as we can see here. So in the bottom gated configuration, basically the gate is below the electrodes and the nanotubes are exposed to air. In the top gated configuration, the gate is above. So even if we have molecules underneath the CNTs, they would likely not be interfering with the overall device uh, working and there is the function of it. Um, so that's why we tested the two. And it's also not exposed to air because there's an insulating layer. And then the gate that modulates the flow of the electrons between the source and the drain, that's onto the surface. That's the key differences between the two structures. The analysis I did. So as a chemist, I had to kind of learn <laughs> about more on the electronic side, but I enjoyed learning about it. Um, so I First, had you show me this slide in 2016 when I started, I've been like, I don't understand. I give up. I don't want to do this. Um, but um, by the time I got to the point, I was like, I love this. This is great. I want to keep doing this. Um, so basically, uh, what we have is an example of the transport of a carbon nanotube field effect transistor here. with a log plot of the drain current versus the gate voltage. And what we have is... Um, as we can see here, there's I off and there's I on. So that's how fast the, so that's the, those are the points when the device turns off and on. And then the ratio between these two, the I on, I off ratio is how fast the, the device turns off and on itself, how fast it switches. Then we have um, these two other parameters here that I'm not really going to cover throughout my talk, but they are important. And they lead me overall to finding out the mobility. So, which is this mu here. Um, so that takes into creation really how fast the electrons flow from one point to the others from between the source and the drain that carrier mobility. And that's a very, very important parameter when we're studying transistors. There's also another plot 
that we use um, when we're doing analysis. And so that is the, the drain current again plotted against the source drain voltage as we change the gate voltage. So the gate, that thing that is either on top or the bottom. And so that gives us the resistance. So when we have a high resistance, that's something where it's more difficult for the carriers to flow through the throughout the surface of the tube. What we really want is a low resistance. And you'll hear of this term called ballistic transport. That means you have basically optimal transport of the electrons flowing throughout your system. So that's the ideal goal is to have the lowest resistance possible. And so I'll summarize kind of the overall research that I did. And many, many attempts <laughs> were had here. And I show the mobility at the top here in centimeter square versus volt seconds, as well as how many devices that were successful versus how many I made total per sample. So first I started with actually LED photolithography because it's a very easy technique to kind of learn, but it's very difficult to master. So using light to make very tiny nanoscale uh, configurations and structures, difficult. <laughs> and uh, especially when we're dealing with such little tiny tubes, because this is with an optical microscope. So it's not at the it's using 10 to the minus six rather than 10 to the minus nine. So there's a little bit of an order of magnitude difference there, so it makes it difficult. As you can see, my results first were not very successful. Um, this is a fairly, fairly low mobility. I then implemented some annealing, so tried to improve the contact between the metal electrodes and the carbon nanotube. That did show some improved performance, uh, as we can observe from higher mobility in the system, but again, a very poor yielding in the number of devices that were successful after lifting off all the excess metal during the patterning process. From there, I optimized a method with LED photolithography in order to get the source and drain as close as possible together together below one micron since the CNTs, the length of them was my one micron itself. So I had to get as close the two electrodes as possible without them touching because that will be a negative. That will be always conducting two metals touching. And so that worked quite a bit, uh, much higher in terms of mobility and in terms of while I was optimizing the process, I got a lot better in terms of my successful devices. However, still not really um, they, room for improvement, I should say. And so I decided to change the types of carbon nanotubes in the solution. So going for um, a 90% purity semiconducting mixture to uh, almost fully 99.9% .9 semiconducting solution. And then um, that seemed to have some benefits. And with that, however, you can see it was still really rolling the dice in terms of what was successful and what was not. So then finally, electron beam lithography was implemented into the system. And then I did, these are the bottom gated configurations, and then I had the top gated configurations as well. Um, and so in uh, the top gate was where we saw the most optimal devices in the system. So between the top and the bottom gate, what we observe here is that, so these are the transport and output plots that I showed before. Um, what we see here is even the same device tested both ways. In the top gate, we observe a 10 times increase in mobility and a higher ion IF ratio. When we tested that, so overall the top gate was the best. When we tested the top gate in different conditions, so in air, regular atmosphere versus vacuum, what we observe here is, again, a very uh, better mobility in vacuum conditions, higher ion-IF ratio, and a decrease in the hysteresis as well, which is also an important parameter. And then finally, when I compare a random network, so the bundle of carbon nanotubes versus the aligned, which our whole purpose was to align CNTs and, and see if they work the best, um, well, they do. There's a 1,000 times increase in mobility an increase in ion IF ratio, as well as a 100 times decrease in the resistance present in our system. So much improvement is observed in the alignment. And that's why we need aligned carbon nanotube FETs. So I know it 
it was all positive results in the past couple of slides. Um, however, research is not always positive. So I did do many different attempts, like an ionic gel gate, Lime Re Bridget deposition, gold nanoparticles in an organic coating. All that was interesting to kind of delve into, but it didn't really work. And that's not going to be a paper, but it's interesting science. And so overall, I did obtain research answers for all the studies I did. Um, sonication was one of the modifications we did to increase alignment, but it decreased density. Adding molecules to fill in the gaps for um, promoting the pi pi stacking that increased the density, but actually affected alignment a little bit. I did also observe what is known as surface dependent anchoring. So depending on the anchoring group used, that actually didn't work on other surfaces. So we needed to tailor the anchoring component to the type of surface that we were targeting for the system and other nanostructures did not work. Um, so the molecule itself will have to be tailored and uh, changed for different systems. And overall, the art carbon nanotubes, are they possible? Yes, these are the best conditions for them. So the question is, how do we stack up versus everybody else? Well, art is about here, high degree of alignment, but low density. Where do we want to be? Well, we want to be here. We want to be the technique that everyone uses. So there's still lots to kind of optimize and do in terms of uh, that research. I didn't do it all by myself. I had collaborators throughout, both here at uh, Waterloo, as well as, as NIMS, the National Institute for Material Science in Japan. So it was a worldwide project and uh, I very much would like to acknowledge and thank collaborators and contributors to the work, um, my funding resources, and yeah, you know everyone that kind of you know, helped me get to where I am today. And so with that, I would like to uh, thank everyone for being here tonight and uh, any questions. I hope I was able to give you an overview of the state of the art that I have developed. There we go. Now, now the audience can hear me as well. All right. So that was a super interesting talk. And uh, like I said, we have some questions, so we'll go ahead and jump straight into it. Um, and if everybody in the chat, please feel free to, you know, you can, you can keep asking questions. There's not like a cutoff. Um, we'll keep going as long as there are questions. Uh, sure. Let's see. So the first one here is, um, can dielectrophoresis be used to align uh, the carbon nanotubes if they could be charged partially? Um. Yes, it can. Uh, the problem is uh, the problem mainly with dielectrophoresis is a good question. Is mainly the scalability aspect. So you can do uh, some alignment with it, mm -hmm. um, but it's really difficult to scale. Okay, all right, that makes yeah. Sense. Okay, yeah. Good um, question. Let's see. So this was. Oh, this was during when you were talking about sort of the the on off of the transistor. Um, okay. What defines the on off points? Is it the flat regions or is it something else? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's when it starts to plateau. Okay. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Uh, let's see. Is there a goal mobility, or do you just try and push as high as possible? Oh, that's a great question. Yes, so we're trying to push as high as possible in this case. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think some mobilities, yeah, you're maybe at 100 centimeters square per volt second. So, um, or yeah, so <laughs> there, there is some quite higher mobilities there. Um, okay. But in this case, we're trying to push uh, as high as possible. But 10 actually is a very good mobility for these carbon nanotube FETs. Okay. Like what, what's, uh, do, do, what's the mobility? Like, I guess, is it silicon or the silicon oxide, uh, FETs? What's, what's the, like, sort of current state of the art, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get back to, oh, what am I doing? Okay. Yeah. I'll go back to the slide. Okay, um, go. yes. Um, uh, so, sorry, I don't think they're on here. Um, why in terms of ion IF ratio and so F the sub threshold slope. Um, that's also a very important parameter that can 
didn't t- touch on. Um, basically, it's the, the slope of how fast you go to the ion IF ratio. Um, okay. That this is, yeah, this is very good. Okay. Um, but with carbon nanotubes, we can get higher. Uh, oh, so okay, that's gotcha. kind of the main thing is that, yeah, silicon is great, but um, carbon nanotubes, even if we're at the uh, larger scale, we still have the same kind of properties as silicon. Oh, okay. That's nice. Okay. All right. If we scale down with CNTs, we can get it to even better results. Right. Okay. And I guess that makes sense. You, you want that, that voltage per decade to be as high as possible because that basically means you can flip on and off very easily. Is that, is yes. That right? Yes, okay. exactly. Oh, that's really cool. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, you may not be at this point, but are you at the point that you can measure voltage jumping between parallel tubes? As I understand it, the problem with current silicon chips is as the transistors get small enough, you get voltage jumping between them. Yes, that is true. Um, and uh, that's why uh, I think we're about, with the fin feds, we're at two to three nanometers. Mm-hmm. And, and we're also seeing kind of that problem in that uh, those structured. Um, the thing with the CNTs is that it is the electrons are confined in the space in the like cylindrical like this the diameter of the tube. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would think that if we're just like a benzene ring apart, that yeah, the the electrons can jump because uh, they can tunnel too, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so mm-hmm. that will be a, a big problem if we're we're too 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 small. Yeah. Um, but it, that, which I guess that kind of brings me back to the slide here. Like, even if we have five nanometer CNT FETs, we're still getting um, better, better performance than we would in the equivalent silicon MOSFET. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess the, other, the thing that I have trouble understanding is, so you, you want these, it, seems, it sounds like you want these to be as, as small as possible. Yeah. I guess to get as many, many of them onto a particular chip or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then at the same time, like each individual transistor needs to have, you know, the, this high, uh, the high voltage per decade. So you, you flip them on and off very quickly and, mm-hmm. but, but then you want, you want low current, right? So you have lower, so it requires l- less power to operate. It seems, yep. it seems like there's a lot of different factors all kind of going together. It's, it's really interesting to see the, the interplay of these things. Um, to try and sort of optimize everything. Yeah, and that's why it's so difficult. That's why this slide is like also so hard because um, the different types of carbon nanotubes, there's so many different types of them yeah. because, yeah, the, this N and M values, you can have 10, 3, you can have 9, 0, you can have 6, 7. Like there's so many vari- variations and mm-hmm. the best working device would be one that has the same as all of all of them. Wow. <laughs> you can very hard. Um, so that's why focusing on just the semiconducting around a certain diameter was my work. Okay. So how it how is the the synthesis? Is it, I guess let me, sorry. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> let me try that again. Is is the synthesis or the controlled synthesis of specific NM carbon nanotubes getting better? Like, are people able to say, okay, I want to make a carbon nanotube that has this in this in and this M value? I'm going to go do that now. Is is that possible or is it still like you make a whole bunch of them and then you sort of try and separate them out and, and see what you have? Yes. Yeah, so right now it's you make a bunch of them and you try to separate them. Okay. Um, however, there are researchers working in actually organic chemistry to start with the benzene rings, mm-hmm. put them in a circle and then grow the carbon nanotube at a specific chirality from there. Ooh. So. Okay. As far as I know, it hasn't been done, um, but there are many researchers trying to do that to get the specific, I want just this type and I'm going to grow it right now. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that would be really cool. If you can, if you can start picking and choosing, then, yes. then that gets very interesting. Okay. Yes. But you can imagine how hard it is since benzene is planar and then you're trying to curve it, right? Because mm-hmm. these are all benzene rings right. and then you have to grow on top of that yeah okay interesting mm-hmm. uh let's see so the next question was uh what drives the hysteresis and how can you continue to improve it oh yes great question because i didn't really cover that um so uh basically what you want is you want the device 
to function the same way as it turns off, as it turns on, or, for, or going from the on state as it goes to the off state. Mm-hmm. And so that can be a variety of different things, like the electrons moving back and forth. They don't move uh, back the same way they came, the exact same way. Mm-hmm. And so that is the key factor that affects the hysteresis. Um, but you want it to be as l- as short as possible, as little of the voltages as possible. And that's why actually in papers, if you read them, they usually don't report the hysteresis when mm-hmm. they really should, because it's hard to know. I was like, oh, is there is a one volt difference? Is it a five volt difference? Who knows? Yeah, that, that seems like it would be kind of important. <laughs> like, yes, it, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so a new paper actually that came out, um, benchmarking field effect transistors and the nanoscale by Aaron Franklin and a huge team of people actually mm-hmm. says, yeah, please report SS hysteresis, all this parameters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Like you, you're you're hiding something that that's not great. <laughs> like, yeah. like you can't do that, or you shouldn't yeah. do that. Rather, um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. But yes. yeah, that's, that's, that's that's a good explanation for why it happens too, because you know that that also makes a lot of sense, especially in something like this where, like I said, you don't know which way it's going to jump, and so that makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. Looks like somebody in our chat made, says, uh, found a paper where they um, where they grew the the carbon nanotubes using the the carbon nanorings like we were describing. Oh, looks perfect! Like maybe they looks thank like you. They've actually done that. Yeah, cool. Appreciate thank that. You. Now the, the trick is scaling. <laughs> yes, very much thank so. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll share that one with you. Um, question and it just it just ran away. Oh no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so I'll go. I'll ask a general question and, and try to remember what I was going to ask. Um, so, in terms of like going forward, you know, it sounds like the the technique that you did this this AR, this art technique, yeah, adds a lot of promise. Um, what what sort of what are sort of the next steps? Like you, you talked a little bit about it. Can you can you elaborate a little bit more on some of the next steps that that need to be uh, taken or or you know goals that need to be achieved for this to sort of become what what you want it to be you know this, this high density and and high degree of or i guess low degree of alignment you know well well aligned very dense um mm-hmm. chips basically or transistors and chips yeah 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 so yeah basically the density it would be the key thing the alignment is fairly good or on par with other techniques it's just the density is fairly low um so i would say like um kind of the filler technique or Maybe what hasn't been studied is the adhesion of the molecule to the surface. Are we really putting as much molecule as possible onto the surface or is it a lot of it missing? Um, So that's something that was never answered. Um, So that really would be the step forward for the project. Okay, that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I did remember remember what the question was, or at least one of the questions I had. Um, In terms of the tweezer, so you talked about you you talked about changing the tweezer for different structures. Um, Is there is there a possibility of like making a tweezer so big that you grab more than one tube at a time and start setting them down with each other? Is is that even a a benefit or no? Uh, Probably not a benefit because you don't want the tubes touching each other because then they can affect conductivities. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it'll be difficult to make a tweezer that big, but it it would it would um, yeah it could do what you're describing yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> make the wings a lot bigger. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Interesting. Okay, very cool. Uh, so I think if if nobody has any more questions, um, that'll be it. But thank you again for a great talk. I really appreciate it. It's super interesting. Yeah, reach I, out I, if you have yeah, anything else. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to doing the podcast. So, <laughs> like I said, that's, that's, that's my first interview, so that that should be a lot of fun. Um, and so, thank you again to everybody for coming out. Uh, we yes, will thank you. Raid, and before before we sign off, I'll raid uh, another channel. The got that right. Um, so thank you, everybody. Please feel you know. Please raid and, and go see the other stream. Uh, nice to support other people. And um, thank you again uh, to Dr. Snowden for a fantastic talk. And if I can get you to hang around for just one second, we'll talk briefly. Um, yes. And to everybody else, uh, thanks for coming out. And I think we are back next week. Um, but uh, not, we'll be back the week after that. Yeah, we're back next week. 
Um, and also, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. This was actually the 100th uh, talk that was given. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Very I'm cool. Honored. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Thank you for coming on. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.